digital audio. Now, digital audio is what we use to record instruments, guitars, voice, and bring them into the computer so that we can play them back, we can manipulate them, we can edit them, do lots of things to them which we couldn't do with tape, where tape was recorded in a linear format, digital audio is not quite the same. And the technology we use to do that is called pulse code modulation, or PCM. And basically this is a technique or digital scheme which transmits analog data and converts it into digital information. It's basically taking a picture of the waveform many times per second and then recreating that picture from those different snapshots that is taken. And similar to taking a sample of a digital photograph, we can edit it in certain ways similar to that. Now when, when we take those snapshots, we enter that in as binary information, which is ones and zeros, and we come up with a PCM file, and some familiar formats that we use and hear about are WAVE, AFF, SD2. These are all PCM files. They're just uh, different extra information built into those, but the core of these files are all the same. They're, they are pulse code modulation. We're going to talk about basically what that, that basically is. Now, a CD is really the first format to really make pulse code modulation a standard, and um, that was really the introduction, the main introduction to the, the consumer market of pulse code modulation with the CD, and that's why it's become such a popular format that it is today, and that's what we use in, in most all of the digital audio workstations, especially the ones that we've discussed so far in this tutorial. So, digital audio. The way pulse code modulation works is basically if we take and make a little graph here, we have our waveform happening from left to right there, and on the left side, on that axis, we have our 16-bit in the example of a CD, and this is our bit depth. Basically, this is how many ones and zeros can be used to define what the level of that wave is, and this defines amplitude. So how loud or soft, how much intensity or little amount of intensity the wave is enacting. On the bottom part, we have our samples per second, and this is measured in the standard for CDs is 44,100 samples per second, and this is definitive of time. So as the wave moves from left to right, it's synonymous with moving through time. So we take samples of these different spots and we're taking these samples 44,100 times per second and at each sample we measure with our 16 bits what our specific amplitude level is and that information is taken in these snapshots and each snapshot is pieced back together at that same sample rate of 44,100 times per second and we can recreate that wave, redraw it back together with those little snapshots. So we have 16-bit which is what we use for CD quality audio and basically with 16 ones and zeros you have 65,536 steps so these are discrete amplitude levels that we can define with these 16 bits of information. So we have a very fine scale there, if you look at it that way, 65,000 steps. And we're doing that, you know, 44,100 times per second. But they came out with 24 bit, which gives us 24 ones and zeros, which is not just 50% more, but exponentially more because of how binary code works. So what we have is 16,777,216 steps available. This gives us a much higher resolution, a lot more discrete amplitude levels that we can define it in, and, and we're still doing that 44,100 times per second, oftentimes with 24-bit, but oftentimes we use higher sample rates, 48,000 times per second, 96,000 times per second, 192,000 times per second. So we're getting very detailed, a lot of resolution here, and a lot of bits that are being used to define this resolution. So, 44,000 
100 times per second. It's often shown as 44.1 kilohertz, and this was chosen for use on CDs and has become the standard sample rate for music because of it. Next is 48 kilohertz, which was developed and used for film. And some like 48 kilohertz because they argue that the math done in the processing is easier and sounds better than it is with 44.1. But really, there's no proof, only speculation and opinion. But still, speculation and opinion is often a, a good motivation for going one way or the other. Next is 96 kilohertz. This was developed a few years ago as processing power increased and storage costs diminished. Now, this format is used in high-quality DVD audio, but it still has no consistent proof that it sounds better than 48 or 44.1. And finally, we have 192 kilohertz, and this is also available in high-end equipment, but rarely used because of how much storage and power it requires, with no hard proof of better sound quality. Now, listening tests between 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz, 192 kilohertz, all with high-quality converters, are usually and most often inconclusive. So that sums up what pulse code modulation is and what techniques are used to sample digital audio. And now it makes a little bit more sense how we can take that and slice it up and use it all over the place in our digital audio workstations. 9quist theory. Now the Nyquist theory basically states that the highest frequency reproduced in pulse code modulation will be half of the sample rate. So for example, if the sample rate is 44.1 kilohertz or 44,100 times per second, then the highest frequency being reproduced will be 22.05 kilohertz. And the idea behind using 44.1 kilohertz is that we hear as humans up to 20 kilohertz. So by doing this, we cover the full range of human hearing by going a little higher than that, 22 kilohertz. So we cover our bases, cover all the frequencies that we can hear as humans. And so that's kind of the theory behind that. And it's all based on this Nyquist theorem of why we have to have the sample rate being twice as much as the highest frequency to be reproduced. And, and this is going to make a little bit more sense in the next couple of slides as we take a look at some circumstances where a frequency would be reproduced and would not be reproduced. So we're going to start with our little chart here. Here's our sine wave, and we're going to say this is a 20 kilohertz sine wave. So if it's 20 kilohertz and we're sampling at 44,100 times per second, and that wave is happening 20,000 times per second, then we're going to have two samples. And most likely these samples are going to hit at the bottom spot there and the top up there. So basically, with those two samples, that's the minimum amounts of samples we can have for one wave to reproduce that wave. And so if we take away the wave, and now we look at those samples and connect the dots basically to to draw our wave that's basically what we get and we curve that around kind of round it off and we have our 20 kilohertz sine wave again now we have a similar situation but this time we have a 40 kilohertz wave if this is being sampled 44,100 times per second and this wave is repeating 40,000 times per second then how often are we going to have samples our first sample is probably going to be here towards the beginning and our second is almost to the very end of that sample again so now with one sample per wave we're not going to reproduce anything so if we take that sine wave away connect the dots all we get is some kind of line, maybe diagonal, straight, but we're not reproducing anything close to a 40 kilohertz sine wave. So that's basically how the Nyquist theory works. We need to have at least two samples per repetition of the wave in order to reproduce it. We need one sample to show that it's going down and one to show that it's going up. And so that's kind of where the Nyquist theory is based in, is that in order to reproduce 20 kilohertz, we need to be sampling twice that, 40,000 times per second, in order to reproduce 20,000 cycles per second. And that is the Nyquist theory.